top of it this morning. Um, so my story is a series all about living your story. And we've been discovering in this series that the decisions that we make today determine the stories that we will tell tomorrow. And that can be so different. I mean, we've talked everywhere from the very beginning of this series. We started with a message titled Start. And we talked about just a, a little thing, a small thing, a, a small choice that seems very insignificant in detail, but actually has the power to affect so much about our life. We talked about the, the simple um, habits that we have in this life and how important those habits are to have because positive habits create positive results in us. And the following week, after that, we talked about stopping something. And this, you know, this message, that message was all about, you know, there are things in our life that we know better that we should not be doing. Things that are having a negative effect on us. Things that right now in the moment might not look so bad, but definitely, definitely are going to have major effects on our future. Because the most small of habits, in a bad way, may seem not to be affecting the world around us. It may be, we think in our minds, well, it doesn't really bother anyone. It's not really affecting anyone. So what's the big deal? But the truth is, is that the, that little small choice that we make every day to do something that we know we shouldn't be doing can have huge effects on our future. And then last week we talked about staying when it would be easier to go. I mean, let's be real. Sometimes we find ourselves at these intersections in life where we just want to run. We want to get away from a situation. We want to get away from a person. We want to get away from something that we're experiencing in this life. We want to just launch out there and run away. And sometimes God tells us it's not time yet. I want you to stay. I want you to stay the course. I want you to stay where you are. I don't want you to lose track of what I'm doing in your life right now because you're just trying to escape the situation. As we talked about last week, there are definitely moments that we come to in life where we need to go. We need to leave a situation. God reveals that to us, and it's important for us to go. And that statement that I was making last week, by no means am I suggesting that you stay in an abusive situation or a trouble that's not healthy or not good for you. And that's not what I was saying. What I, what I meant by that is that, you know, that sometimes when we are serving God, we come up to these straining moments and we just want to quit. We want to throw in the towel and say, I'm done, I'm finished. This is just too much for me to handle. And God's saying, no, stay the course, stay with me, fight through this, work through this. The key verse that we've been reading throughout this series is Hebrews 12, 2. Um, and it says, let us fix our eyes on Jesus, the author and perfecter of our faith. We know that he is the author of our faith. And if we fix our eyes on Jesus, if we fix our focus and our gaze, if we are diligent about keeping our eyes on him, he becomes the author of our story. And we want him to be the author of our story because, let's face it, his story is much better than any story that we could have ever created on our own. Anything we could have fabricated or put together. His story is amazing. And at the end of our life, we are going to want to be the ones who lived the story that he had for us. As a friend of mine once said, and I've said this to you guys before, one moment in your life, your life is going to flash before your eyes. Make sure it's worth watching. Make sure it's worth watching. And so this morning, this morning we're going to be talking about, I decided to go. I decided to go. And I know this seems kind of contrary to last week, but there are moments where we get comfortable in our pose, comfortable in our current circumstances, comfortable in where we are, and we don't want to go. And God is saying it's time to go. Some of the chapters of our life have yet to be written because God, for the longest time, is pushing us out there and saying, go. And we're saying, no, I'm not ready. I'm not prepared. I'm not comfortable. I don't know if I'm the right person for this. Our perceptions may be different in what 
situation specifically I'm talking about. But we will all face those climactic moments in our lives that require a single yet profound step that will change the direction of our life. That will change the direction of our life. And it may seem like I'm reminiscing a little bit about what I first preached about the first week. But I want to ask you, I want to encourage you, I want to tell you this morning that you need to really take an inventory of your life. And there may be something that you have been waiting on, that you have set in pause. And God is saying, it's time to go. It's time to do this one thing. It's time to move forward. There comes a moment in our life where we sense there's something more. We, 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 just, we feel like we're not doing enough or we feel like God has something big. God has something major for us. And, and so and contrary to what we were talking about last week, not in a negative way, but sometimes the best decision you can make is to go when it would be easier to stay. Sometimes the best decision you can make is to go when it'd be easier to stay. Because we grow accustomed to our comforts. We grow accustomed. It's kind of strange. Because because we call them comforts, but let's be honest, sometimes they're really not comfortable. We grow accustomed to where we are right now in the moment. We grow accustomed to what we're experiencing right now, and we think it's better here. When the truth is, is it's not better here. It's not the right place. It's not what God has for us. It's not where God wants us. Amen? I want to talk to you guys about Abram or Abraham. He went by two different names, and his story is pretty significant. You know, his story is pretty powerful because God spoke to Abram. God spoke to Abraham and told him to make a major step in this life. And Abraham did something drastic. Abraham did something big. Abraham, it wasn't just a a little situation. Abraham literally picked up his belongings, picked up what he had, and he ventured out into the wilderness. We've grown accustomed to the noise and the distractions. And when this call comes to us, we see it as an irritant, but it unsettles us. This call, just like, it grabs a hold of us. I don't know if you guys are there or you've experienced it before, but it's like, you just can't sleep at night sometimes. You just, you're like, I gotta do something about this. I gotta do something about this. And then we pass it on or we pass it by. I've gotta move forward in this. I've gotta progress in this. I've gotta go in this direction. And, and it just, it's like, it's unsettling. It's just, it's frustrating. But God just won't leave us alone, will it? He keeps talking to us. He keeps reminding us. He keeps telling us of those things that we need to do. He keeps telling us of that direction that we need to step forward in. And Abram found himself in that place. Abram found himself in that place. You know, I imagine that Abram had dreams of a family that he would one day have. I imagine that Abram would probably, in the night, think about a beautiful home and all the children that he wanted to have and all the children that he wanted to raise, but for whatever reason, him and his wife had yet to be able to conceive. And all these dreams that he had, all these aspirations, all these hopes, all these desires, somehow, as life took shape, And he got old, and his wife got old, and things changed for them. He watched as that dream that he had, that passion to have a family and to live happily ever after began to fade away. He probably felt the pangs of wanting and desiring children, but never experiencing that, never having that happen. I imagine that he dreamed at night, but then watched as the dream of a son or a daughter or any kind of children just disappeared from his mind, awakening to that agony of thinking, am I ever going to experience what what I really desire, what I really yearn for? And then... One night, a voice comes to him, and we find this in Genesis 12. A voice comes to him. The Lord said to Abram, leave your country, your people, and your father's household, and go to the land that I will show you. 
This is what I want you to do. I want you to leave your country, your people, and your father's household and go to a land I will show you. Okay, he didn't say go to a land I've, I've shown you. He said go to a land I will show you. That means that that had yet to be revealed. That means that Abram had to walk out in faith into a direction that he didn't know what was. He didn't know where he was headed or what was, uh, what was, where he was going and what direction he was moving. And all he knew is a voice came to him and said, leave your country, your people, your father's household, and go to the place or go to the land that I will show you. Begin to move. God's saying, leave everything you do know to a place you don't know. Because of the God you do know. Let me say that again. He's saying leave everything you do know to a place you don't know because of the God you do know. You see, God called Abraham out of, or Abram out of idolatry when he was in Ur of Chaldees and a city devoted to worshiping the moon god Nanner. (laughs) Which is kind of weird, but. And like, if you read into this story, you find that Abraham actually finds himself kind of halfway in between where he was and where God wants him to be. He's just wandering. And this voice comes to him and it says, leave your family, leave everything you know, leave your material comforts, leave the things that you're familiar with, leave the things that you understand, the things that you've grown to live with, leave all of that and step into the things that I'm going to show you. Step into the place where I'm going to reveal to you. You see, when, when, we, when we, we've got to come to that place where we decide to, in order to approach and walk into our destiny, in order to walk into our destiny, we've got to leave our security. We've got to leave the things that we're comfortable with, right? We don't like that, do we? We like where we are. We like what's comfortable to us. We like what's, what's right to us. We like being satisfied in our moment, in our experience, and what's going on in our life right now. And God is telling us, in order to walk forward in the destiny that I have for you, you've got to leave your security. Now, keep in mind the term that I'm using here, your security. I'm not talking about leaving and going to a place that you're insecure. And you've got to realize that God is with you and that he's your security. He's your support. He's your strength. He's your stability. But in order to walk into the insurmountable, the We can't categorize it. We can't explain it. We can't understand it. We can't put it in a box. In order to walk into the direction that he has for us, we've got to leave the area that we're comfortable with. Some of us in this room, God is merely saying, it is time to go. It is time to go. When it would be easier to stay. It is time to go when things seem more more familiar right now where you're at. It's time to go when things seem easier in this moment. And my tablet stopped working. It's all right. Go to the next slide, guys. So in Genesis 12, 2 through 3, this is what it says. I will make you into a great nation and I will bless you and I will make your name great and you will be a blessing and I will bless those who bless you and whoever curses you, I will curse and all the peoples on earth will be blessed through you. It's a school project, no worries. (laughs) Just another indication that technology is straight from somewhere. Anyway, so, so God is saying to Abraham... Step out of what you know because I'm about to do something. I'm about to open wide a blessing, open wide something so massive and so mighty in your life. We we grow accustomed to where we, we are at and we don't live in the full blessing of God. It's like it's like this. And I heard a preacher saying this before. It's like this. It's like it's like we have somehow we, we've we've come to understand God, we've come to understand grace, we've come to understand who Jesus is, but somewhere in the process of coming to know him, we've not chose to have faith in him. 
Like, like a lot of the conversations we have are, do you believe in God? Well, yeah, it's one thing to believe in God or to believe what the scriptures have to say about him or to believe in what he's doing. It's another thing entirely to put your faith in him. Like, there's a lot of people right now that come to church and they believe in God and And they believe in the words that are spoken to them on Sundays. They believe in the things that are being shared. But there's this this moment where they have to step over whatever you would call it, a threshold or a chasm. They have to step over this one thing that seems to be interfering. and, and, And they don't know if they can bridge the gap between just believing and fully trusting. Just believing and fully trusting. I mean, imagine for a moment that you're Abraham. Imagine for a moment that God says to you, go to a land. Go to a land that I will show you. What would you do? How would you respond? Don't worry about it, baby. It's all here. How would you respond? I love you and appreciate you, though. How would you respond to that? How would you respond to that? If God said to you, I'm I'm not going to tell you where. I'm not going to tell you what. I'm not going to explain to you specifically. I just want you to start moving in this direction. Would you have faith to go? Would you have faith to trust and believe in the plan that he has for you? Would you have faith to completely surrender and submit and just lunge forward into that? Would you? You see, we're not changed by making promises to God. We're changed by believing the promises God made to us. Grab this. This is critical. This is pretty important to your faith. This is pretty important to who you are. We've got to believe in the things that he's already declared over us. We've got to believe in the things that he's already spoken over us. We've got to believe in what he's already submitted to us. Some of you guys have come to those moments like like Abraham, where you had dreams, and somewhere in the sojourn, somewhere in the journey, somewhere where you've been walking from where you are now to where you want to be, you got paused and halted right in the middle, and you still have a passion for what you believe God wants you to do, but you don't know where that's going to lead you. You don't know what that looks like, and you're scared. You're scared. You're scared. But there's something that we need to understand about all this. We cannot fully experience the entire blessing of God until we step out in faith. We're going to get just a, a flawed experience. Like, like some of us walk through this life and we say, well, I go to church and I do my things that I'm supposed to do. I, I keep my commitments that I made to God. I should be happy. But we, we're just shy of complete surrender. We're just shy of letting it all go. We're just shy of releasing ourselves completely to him. And as a result, we live miserable lives, just shy of all that he has for us. Imagine if Abraham chose not to step forward in faith. Imagine if Abraham chose not to do this. Imagine Abraham said, no, I'm I'm good. I don't don't know if I can, I I don't know. I mean, that sounds kind of risky. That sounds kind of dangerous. I'm scared. I don't, I don't know if I can do this. I don't know if I can step forward in that. But see, Abraham, this wasn't about him making a promise to God saying, God, I'll do this for you. This was about Abraham grabbing the promise that God made to him and Abraham holding on without letting go and allowing God to steer him in the direction that, Abraham had, that God had for Abraham. Steering him in the direction that God had plotted out for his life. And some of us in this room, we're in that moment where God's been whispering quietly into our ear, This is where I want you to go. This is what I want you to do. And this is a big step. This is a substantial step. Like your peers may hear what this step is and might think, oh, well, that's not really a huge ordeal. That's not really a big deal. I mean, come on, really. But like to you, you know that this step is the one, like that one thing. It's that one climactic moment. It's that one experience, at least in your life right now, that if you don't take, if you don't take, 
then you're going to miss out. You're going to miss out on what God has for you. You're going to miss out on the blessings that he has for your life. You're going to miss out on everything that he wants you to encounter. Go ahead and jump to the next slide, guys. So Abraham left as the Lord told him. Abraham left as the Lord told him. And we know that the story continues. Let's see if this is working now. We know that the story continues, right? Like, we know, we know how the story continues. Abraham is this old guy, all right? His wife, Sarah, or Sarai, has long passed menopause. <laughs> she is probably at menostop. <laughs> There's no way that she's going to have kids, right? I mean, it's just not going to happen. And, and I, you, There we go. There's some humor in there. All right. And, and God says, and God says, you're going you're to be a great nation. Like in the book of Hebrews, just, just bouncing forward for a minute, in the book of Hebrews, in, in 11, 8 through 12, this is what it says. And by faith, Abraham, when he called to go to, when, when, when called to go to a place he would later receive as an inheritance, obeyed and went, even though he did not know where he was going. And by faith, he made his home in the promised land like a stranger in a foreign country. He lived in tents, as did Isaac and Jacob who were heirs with him of the same promise. For he was looking forward to the city with foundations, whose architect, the builder, is God. And by faith, even Sarah, who was past childbearing age, see, men have stopped, was enabled to bear a child because, of, because she considered him faithful, who had made the promise. And so from this one man, and he as good as dead, <laughs> came descendants as numerous as the stars in the sky and the countless as the sand of the seashore. Um, okay, understand the description of Hebrews. A man who's good as dead. He is old. <laughs> I mean, like, we're talking close to expiring. And God's like, you're going to have children. And God's revealing to them how mighty this amount of children is going to be. For Hebrews to use an example like as numerous as the stars are in the sky. I don't know if you guys have ever walked out in the night here in North Country. But on a clear night when you look into the sky there is something so capturing and so beautiful. And you just see all these stars. And a man who is as good as dead, is told, those are going to be your descendants. Your descendants are going to number the stars in the sky. Your descendants are going to number the sand on the seashore. I mean, that's like, that's like crazy talk, right? God, it was fun trying, but this isn't going to happen. It's just not going to take place. I mean, we've spent years up to this point. My wife is old. It's over. It's done. I don't think that we can come to this place where this is going to work. And some of us, let's be honest, are old in this life. Some of us have been at this same dream for a long time and we've been hoping and praying and dreaming and desiring and believing for something and we've stopped somewhere in between or we've given up entirely because we just don't think it's possible anymore. And God is compelling you this morning. Maybe it's time to reignite an old flame that you let burn out. And God is saying, rekindle that dream that you gave up on. Rekindle that hope that you let go of. Hey, buddy. Rekindle what you've lost, what you've lost hope in accomplishing. I'm telling you guys, sometimes we grow accustomed to our comforts and we come to a morning like this. And God says, I want you to believe again for something that you let go of long ago. And I want you to trust that it's going to happen. I want you to trust that it's going to take place. I want you to trust that I am going to do what I said I would do. And you're like, this is ridiculous. And if you look at the story of Abraham and Sarah, 
And they can't conceive, and they can't conceive, and they're like, okay, well, we're supposed to have all these descendants, so you know what? I'm going to find a servant, you sleep with her. And that created all kinds of trouble in itself. For the record, I want to save you in, from, from, from trouble and trauma. When God gives you a promise, when you think that it's not happening fast enough, or it's not progressing quick enough, or you're not getting there when you want to, step back and rely on his timing instead of trying to force it. Because forcing it fudges it. <laughs> it's going to make it a mess. And you're not going to get there. And you're not going to be completely what God has ordained. Trust him. Step back and have faith. Have faith that he will do what he said he will do. I mean, can you imagine a man who's good as dead and a woman past menopause and then suddenly she starts showing? What is going on here? I mean, can you imagine? Can you imagine in your own life in a dream that is as good as dead, suddenly conceived again, suddenly reborn. See, I look at this audience this morning, I look at the people in our church, I look at the people I encounter, and I see such amazing potential that has yet to be unearthed. I see such amazing things that have yet to be accomplished such incredible things that God wants to do through you that have yet to be born because you've given up on them. Perhaps the timing that God had for them is not right or you are, you're just afraid or you've gotten comfortable. I want to encourage you guys. I want to encourage you guys to believe again, to believe again. And when God says, go like Abraham, go. Don't second guess it. Don't question it. Don't doubt it. Don't refuse and say, I'm more comfortable here because the truth is that sometimes it feels more comfortable where you're at, but it's only going to cause you more suffering. And you're going to feel overwhelmed and frustrated and undone because you feel like, man, you're just, you're not... Let me say it like this. You're not going to experience the complete blessing and the fullness of God's promise until you finally surrender it all. Until you finally let go of it all. And you do exactly what God tells you to do. You don't barter and trade with him. You don't make excuses. You don't try to say, well, if I do it this way, it'll go better this way. Or can I try it this way? Or th-? No, you just you surrender and you begin to walk forward in God's plan. And you watch as he does magnificent things. You watch as he does Wonderful things. Let me, let me end with a couple thoughts here. What does God want you to want? And we've asked that every week. We've asked that every week. What does God want you to want? Because that's, I mean, that's, that's pretty critical in order to accomplish <laughs> the plan that he has for your life. You've got to know what he wants you to want. You've got to place your trust in that. The second question I want to ask you is this, is, is um, what step of faith do you need to take right now? What is it? What is it? I really believe that, you know, I really believe that that I'm going to need, and and I'm just going to speak personally for a minute, I really believe that I'm going to need your support and I'm going to need you guys to camp and come around the vision and the plan that God has for this church. I mean, we're excited about what's going on right now. We're seeing more people. We're seeing new faces. We're, we're just pumped about more people coming and, and, and so on. And that's exciting. But I believe that there's so much more in store. I believe that there's so much more that God wants to do here. I believe that there's so much more that God wants to accomplish in this place. And God, right now, there are things that he's telling me, things that he, that I'm believing for as a church. And they're going to, there's going to come a moment where we're going to, we're going to come to that crossroads and we're going to say, okay, I got to go. We got to go as a church. We got to trust God as a church. We got to move forward as a church. We got to believe that this is really what God has in store for us. And we just, we got to go for it. We got to go for it.
Is it possible that God can change a community because of a group of people? Absolutely. Is it possible that God could do marvelous things through one body of believers? Absolutely. We call it like, like we've kind of like ignorantly said, I want to be reckless about my faith, but there's nothing reckless about it when we completely abandon and surrender to God. I'm telling you this morning, whatever it is in your life where you feel stuck or you're afraid to move forward, God is telling you it's time to go. It's time to go. It is time. It is time to respond. Abraham had ridiculous faith. Ridiculous faith. I mean, he was called, and I know how crazy this sounds, he was called to begin having sex with his wife again and trusting for a child. I mean, can you imagine them, like, is this really going to happen? This is crazy. This is crazy. Have faith that the seemingly impossible can take shape in your life. Trust him again. Trust him again. Because one day you're going to tell your story. One day people are going to remember your story. And I would, I would submit to you, what do you want that story to point to? A person who could have been or a person who was and a person who is and a person who completely surrendered and responded and saw the amazing works of God. Amen? Amen. 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 I want to show you guys a video clip real quick. Let me tell you a story. It's no ordinary tale. No, it's the ordinary from which every other story hails. It's the story of God. It's the story of history. And I'm not the author, no. The author is a glorious mystery. See, long before he would put his pen to the paper, long before there was time or before there was matter, he was there all alone. Father, Son, Holy Spirit, one God in three persons, everlasting in existence, completely satisfied, needing absolutely nothing. He was happy in himself and his joy was overflowing. The Son in the arms of his holy, righteous Father, the Spirit overshadowing, all glorifying one another. So why would this God even bother to create the fountain of all happiness? Can you improve upon this state? Well, the joy within himself welling up at such capacity was so full it must be shared with a glorious society. So the mighty author, quill in hand, to share his infinite mind, his love, his joy, sat down to write his once upon a time. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. He made all things to reflect his beauty and his worth. Mountains, rivers, oceans, trees, all gladly testifying. Endless stars and galaxies declare his glory shining. He made it all and it was good. And to culminate his work, he fashioned man and breathed to life his special ball of dirt. Man came to life with blinking eyes and was welcomed by God's face. They walked with him every day and night. There was peace and no such thing as shame. God said, be fruitful, fill the earth, and eat from any tree, except for this one, because if you do, you'll surely fall from me. Now, why do this and give this choice? Because he is writing a story, and he's about to show the whole world the fullness of his glory. Conflict enters early on in the script with a snake in the garden doing what he does best, running his lip. Flashback to when this evil was created. He was an angel of heaven who fell when his head got inflated. Banished from God and from his endless mercy, he came down to earth to tempt us with the unworthy. So there in the garden on an ordinary day, he came to the woman and said, Did God really say that you should not eat from every tree in the garden? He must not want your happiness or you'd have total freedom. So pridefully they listened, sinfully they took, and scorned their creator as they ate forbidden fruit. Injustice, my friends, this is injustice. That God should be seen and then treated as a nothing. That man should completely forfeit his joy and dig for fleeting pleasures in the gutters of this world. Fallen now is all mankind and sure to face his judgment. A world of pain, of toil and strain and hell forever after. But God would make a promise to preserve himself a people. And through the brokenness of man, oh, could there shine a hero? The plot line continues, some character development, all supporting actors, all fantastic as embellishment. Noah found favor in God's holy sight, and when God sent the floods, he mercifully preserved his life. We 
would come to Abraham and God made him a covenant. He said, I will bless you, make your offspring abundant. To Isaac and to Jacob, God would come and do the same. And though many dangers came to threaten his perfect plan, the story would go on with the author's full control and he would lead his people everywhere that they should go. Flash forward now 400 years in Egypt, there's a Pharaoh who doesn't like God's people growing numerous in freedom. He made them slaves, but God came down and chose his servant Moses, a burning bush, a call to go. His presence was his promise. Moses, tell that Pharaoh now to let my people go so they can freely worship me in the place that I will show. Plagues numerous, God will prove that he is the I am, that Pharaoh's rule is like a pawn in his glorious hand. The waters part, the millions leave to follow their great savior. He guided them, provided for them, though they were so ungrateful. At Sinai, God gave the law so perfect and so pure. His people soon discovered, though, they could not obey these rules. They tried, they failed, they tried, they failed. Compelled to live in sin, they'd bow to worship idols and they'd bow to God again. They said to God, give us a king and that will make things better. God, their rightful king, assured them this would be a fetter. They insisted, God relented, gave to them their kings. Some were good, led them to him, some brought idolatry. Then came the prophets, turn back to God. Sometimes the people listened, but mostly they just gave a nod because they all wanted to be him. God will not wink at your sin, the prophets would all say. The people rose to eat and drink, they left to go and play. God finally seemed to have enough and brought a blaring quiet. The prophets ceased, the people waited 400 years of silence. Enter our protagonist, mostly unannounced. The plot is quickly rising now. Who is this guy? Nobody really knows. He's meek, he's humble, an ordinary hero. But the craziest thing about this character is, well, unlike the other characters, this is the author himself. His name was Jesus. He was born of a virgin, fully God. He was perfect, fully man. He was learning, different from all the others, but tempted just the same in every single way we are, yet without a single sin. He made the lame to jump and he caused the blind to see. And unlike the religious leaders, he had some real authority because he came from on high and he came to redeem not to be served but to serve his haters and enemies he loved he gave showed us the heart of the author claimed no glory for himself because he came from his father and we hated him for it because we wanted to be God despised and rejected we esteemed him not conflict escalating now it starts with a betrayal Judas whores his eternal Lord for 30 pieces of silver a final meal of prayer and then they head into the garden where Jesus sweat with drops of blood preparing for our pardon the soldiers took the Lord away and led him to a trial are you the son of God they say I am there's no denying except of course for his disciples who left their Lord in fear Jesus looked up to the sky he was all alone from here They led him to the praetorium and then they began to beat him. Who hit you? They would shout and say, oh father, please forgive him. They made his back a bloody mess. They whipped him till he lost his breath. They threw the cross upon his wounds, the weight of sin, 300 pounds. The great eternal Lord of all, the author of all things, now like a lamb to the slaughter. Would this be his defeat? They nailed him to the rugged cross. They shouted out, where is your God? He said, have you forsaken me? He takes a breath, his final three. It is finished. The Savior's cry. And then he bowed his head. The author of life, the Lord of all, the Son of God is dead. They laid his body in a tomb. Then everything was quiet as God's people find themselves again in everlasting silence. Two days pass. On the second morning after Jesus died, Mary went to the tomb to take a look inside. And when she arrived, she was met by an angel. She fell to the ground, but he said, there's no danger. This Jesus, Jesus, is he the one you seek? Mary, he is not here. He is risen indeed. Climax is true. Every good story has one. That part where you feel a slight shift of momentum. Mary sprints to go tell the other disciples, the Lord, he's alive. He's alive like he promised. Peter and John go to see for themselves, but there's nothing there. Perhaps he truly lives. Then Jesus words came flashing to mind they will kill the son of man but after three days he will rise momentum is surely building now the enemy is limping Jesus finds the 12 and then he gives to them the mission all authority is mine all in heaven and on earth go and tell them I'm alive go and tell the whole wide world and don't get slack I'm coming back acts now the church is born the Holy Spirit given the news of Jesus like the most contagious sickness spreading thousands saved a mighty wind is blowing through the region the promise God gave to 
Abraham, we're finally starting to see it. Repentance and forgiveness preached all in the name of Jesus. Sinners and saints alike proclaim our God has come to save us. The Gentiles hear the story and the news is blowing up. The plan is working, gospel spreading from Asia to Africa. Martyrs laying down their lives because they know this story is true. It's a story like no other. It's a movement you cannot undo. Constantine tried to slow it down and turn it into steeples, but an angry monk from Germany wrote some holy gospel thesis. It spread like fire and then it came to America by sail. And here we are, the 21st century, because the gospel cannot fail. It's the greatest story that's ever been told by the greatest author the world has ever known. But there is some still left to go. Yes, there is some still left to go. See, go was the command to every tribe and nation to carry this great story to this dying generation because when this gospel finally spreads across the whole of earth we're going to hear a trumpet sound and Jesus will return heaven will be opened and a white horse shall appear and the one who sits upon it all his enemies shall fear his eyes will be like fire and his purpose will be glory justice for all evil life for all who love this story He'll come to judge the quick, the dead, and all who trod this world. Every knee will bow and tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord. Death and Hades he will throw into the lake of fire, and Satan too, that serpent foe, that coward, that old liar. The church will rise, surround the throne, and clothed in glory his. With every tribe and tongue, we will worship him, singing, worthy, worthy is the Lamb, the Lamb who has been slain. Blessing and honor, glory and power forever to his name, and for ages and ages we will sing the praises of our God and King. It's the greatest story that's ever been told by the greatest author the world has ever known. Yeah, the bad guys lose, the good guys win. Jesus is Lord of all the end. When asking ourselves what step we take next, I want to encourage you guys to posture yourself in a place with your hands wide open in complete trust. With your hands wide open in complete trust. To posture yourself in a place where God can give his entire blessing and promise to you. The only place, the only way that it's going to fit, the only way that God is going to do this marvelous work in you is if you let go of everything else and you remove everything else and you make space for what he has for you. God wants to, he wants your life to be a beautiful story, a reflection of how wonderful and how great and how amazing he is. When he began to speak to Abraham, it was just, it was an indication that It was an indication that God wanted to do something marvelous and he just wanted a willing vessel who would respond. I don't know anybody in this life who doesn't want their life to be something incredible and something great. But God was making an offer to Abraham. If you respond, your life will be incredible and your story will be amazing. People will be in awe because of what I've done in your life. In your life. Posture yourself. Posture yourself in the place where God can fully and completely bless you. And when God says go, go. Amen. Amen. Let me pray. Father God, I thank you for this morning. God, I thank you for um, speaking in spite of issues with technology and other things God I just I ask Lord that the that the message that you had for these folks God that it would be realized Lord that our story is something that we want to be living in order to honor and glorify and praise your name God that there is something perhaps in our life that we just have yet to make that step Or perhaps we're stuck somewhere in the middle. We've come some way, but we've not come all the way. I pray, God, this morning 
that we would place our complete faith in you, that we would open our hearts to you, that we would trust you completely. And God, when you say go, even though it may look frightening, even though where we are today may look easier, even though being here and not there looks more simple and makes more sense, I pray, God, that we would realize that in order to get where you want us to go, we've got to leave where we are now and begin trusting you for every step that we take along the journey, even if it appears by all means and physical standards to be completely and entirely impossible. Because we know, Lord, that impossible is not a word that you even know. Build our faith, God. And I pray that as we position ourselves to receive the fullness of everything that you have for us, as we go when you tell us to go, that we would be nothing less than awed by all that you accomplish in us. I pray for bravery and confidence in this room that in the face of fear, and the doubt that comes, the concern that we will fail, God, that we would just step up and step forward and go. And just go. Speak to our hearts this morning, God. Continue to show us what it is that we're to do. Amen.